I'm Cassandra Clare, and welcome to our Chain of Iron table read. I've assembled some fantastic authors here to help me out in reading aloud a scene from Chain of Iron for your enjoyment. So you guys introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Holly Black, and I will be playing the parts of Alistair and Tessa. Hi, I'm Danielle Clayton, and I will be playing the part of Cordelia. Hi, I'm Zoraida Cordova, and I will be playing Will Herondale. Hi, I'm Maureen Johnson. I'll be playing Charles and the Footman. I'm Adam Silvera, and I'm your boy, James. <laughs> All right, I will be playing the part of the omniscient and omnipotent narrator. So we open at a party. Cordelia is looking over at her brother. Alistair looked, well, Alistair looked expressionless, or would to someone who didn't know him. Cordelia knew by his slumped posture, he was nearly sliding down the pillar, and his tightly fisted hands that he was quite upset. I know you read mundane newspapers too. I wondered if you noticed the recent murder in the East End. It's the sort of thing that seems as if it shouldn't interest us, but on closer examination. Cordelia stepped up to Alistair, blinking demurely. She knew people were watching. She wanted to give them no reason to talk. Charles, I believe that you agreed to stay away from my brother. Charles raised a superior eyebrow. Cordelia, dear, men have disagreements among themselves sometimes. It's best to leave them be to sort it out. Cordelia looked at Alistair. Do you wish to converse with Charles? No. Charles flushed. Only Alistair. Alistair, only a coward needs to be rescued by his little sister. Alistair's expressive eyebrows flickered. And only an ass puts people into situations in which they need to be rescued at all. Charles took a deep breath, as if you're about to shout. Cordelia moved swiftly between him and her brother. Her smile was starting to make her face ache. Charles, go away now, or I will tell everyone how your aunt and uncle must go rushing off to Paris to rescue the clave from your blunder. Charles's eyes narrowed, and somehow in that moment Cordelia saw Matthew and him. She could not imagine why. There could not have been two more different people. If only Charles was more kinder, more understanding, and perhaps Matthew would not. Cordelia blinked. Charles had said something, undoubtedly something cutting, and stomped off. As he did, she noticed they were indeed being watched by Thomas. He was gazing at them from across the room, seemingly arrested in mid-motion. Behind him, James had rejoined his friends and was chatting with them, one hand lightly on Matthew's shoulder. Several things happened at once. Thomas, seeing Cordelia looking at him, blushed and turned away. The music ended and the dancers began to stream off the floor. And Grace left Toby without a word and came up to James. Matthew and Christopher had been laughing together. Matthew stopped, staring as Grace said something to James, and the two of them stepped a bit apart from the others. James was shaking his head. His silver bracelet glimmered on his wrist as he gestured. I'm going to go over and uh, break James's legs. He can hardly run away screaming if Grace approaches him. He must be polite. As you were polite to Charles? Don't take it the wrong way, Layla. I'm grateful, but you don't need to... Out of the corner of her eye, Cordelia saw James break away from Grace. He came toward her. He was white as a sheet, but otherwise, his mask was firmly in place. Alistair, good to see you. Are your parents well? Alistair had told her she didn't need to be polite, but politeness had its uses. James wore his manner li- manners like a suit of armor, a suit to match his mask. <clears throat> well enough. The Silent Brothers recommended my mother rest at home given her condition. My father didn't want to leave her. Some of this was doubtless true, and some of it wasn't. Cordelia didn't have the heart for investigation. She no longer had the heart for the party at all. James hadn't betrayed their agreement, but it was clear that it caused him pain to be in the same room as Grace. The worst part was that she could sympathize. She knew what it was like to be near the person you loved, but feel as if you were a million miles away. James, I find I have a rather desire to play chess. That brought a smile from James, though only a slight one. Of course, we shall depart at once. Play chess? How thrilling. Alistair. Cordelia kissed Alistair goodbye on the cheek as James went to offer the necessary excuses to their hosts. They collected their things in silence and soon found themselves on the front steps of the Wentworth's house waiting for their carriage to be brought around. It was a lovely night. Grace had watched them go, a thoughtful expression on her face. Cordelia could not help but wonder how much she concealed. It was not like her to approach James. Perhaps she had felt desperate. Cordelia could not blame her if she did. But she could not ask James because they were not alone on the steps. Tessa and Will were there. Tessa was smiling up at Will as she tucked her hands into fur-lined gloves. He bent to brush her hair from her forehead. James cleared his throat loudly. Otherwise, they'd start kissing. Believe me, I know. Tessa seemed delighted to see them. She beamed at Cordelia. 
Don't you look lovely? Dreadful we have to leave the party so early. Fortunately, Miss Highsmith has offered poor Philomena the use of her carriage later, but we're meant to portal to Paris early tomorrow morning. She did not, Cordelia noted, mention Charles. We tried to approach you inside, but were cut off by Rosamund chasing Toby around because their ice sculpture had melted. What does it mean for the youth of today that they don't know that ice melts? What are we teaching them in the schoolrooms? Is this another youth of today's speech? He dropped his voice into a passable imitation of Will's. Running about, no morals, using ridiculous words like barmy and brinkets. Even I know brinkets is not a word. He and James bantered back and forth as the Institute's carriage rolled around the corner and stopped at the foot of the steps, driven by a skinny footman in silver and ivory. Cordelia could not help but think how different James's relationship with his father was from Alistair's with Elias. She wondered sometimes what Elias would say if he knew about Alistair and Charles. She wanted to think he wouldn't care. Months ago, she would have been sure of it. Now she was sure of nothing. A reverie was broken by a sudden shout. The skinny footman had leapt to his feet, looking about, wild-eyed. <laughs> Damon! Damon! Cordelia stared. Something that looked like a spinning wheel covered in wet red mouths shot out from under the carriage and rolled about in a circle. She reached for Cartana and flinched, her palm stinging. Had she cut herself on it somehow? That couldn't be possible. James laid a hand on Cordelia's shoulder. It's all right. There's no need. Will was looking at Tessa, his blue eyes wide. Can I? Tessa smiled indulgently, as if Will had asked for a se second helping of cake. Oh, go ahead. Will made a whooping sound. As Cordelia stared in puzzlement, he leaped down the stairs and raced off, chasing the wheel demon. Tessa and James were both smiling. Should we help him? No. That demon and my father are old friends, or rather, old enemies, but it amounts to the same thing. It likes to chase him around after parties. That is very peculiar. I see that I have agreed to marry into a very peculiar family. Don't pretend you didn't know that already. Huh. <laughs> Cordelia laughed. It was all so ridiculous and yet so very much the way James's family always was. She felt as if things were almost normal again by the time their carriage came around and they clambered into it. As they rolled off into the night, they passed Will, brandishing a seraph blade as he happily chased the wheel demon through the Wentworth's Rose Garden. End of scene. Demon! Also much, woo, we did it! <laughs>